Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, thank you for the uh, patience during the extended sound check. I think we're connected to California or somewhere like that. I'm not absolutely sure. This may have been what would have happened at the One Direction concert the other night. Um, who knows? So uh, I don't want any crying people outside and, and sort of mobbing the speakers. Um, we have a really good program tonight. Could I just, in the interest of keeping everything as short and sweet as possible, I'd just like to thank Wendy Ward uh, and Liz McCulloch who provided the food tonight. Uh, and maybe you'll get a chance to speak to them and, and have a look at their leaflets and things. Thanks very much. Um, as usual, we have three excellent speakers here. I've heard them once or twice before, and they're all very good. Um, the topics are really what we all want to hear in primary care. The subjects are things that people are asking us about. Uh, if, if you look at the symptom management at the end of life, we're always trying to keep on top of this. The ethical issues at the end of life, which Caroline is an absolute expert in, we, um, we're going to talk about that because we get a lot of questions these days about assisted dying and living wills and you know people traveling to uh, Switzerland and things like that. So it'll be good to get a, a, a sort of feel for that. Um, Tracy's going to talk to us about the care of the dying pathway which used to be the Liverpool Care Pathway, which has died to death, left a huge vacuum. I'm sure all of us and, and some of you guys in particular uh, would have a lot of opinions on this. Um, we have quite a, a good length of time for questions afterwards, so I would expect there'll be quite a few questions about that. And then to start off, um, we have David Rogers here from ICP, and he and I were doing some stuff to support Osmond and the team in setting up some new structures in palliative care, which Osmond's going to talk to us about, and new services that are available. Um, could I also just ask, at the end, there, there's an evaluation. If you could just fill those in for us, it would be great. Could I also just thank, rather than at the end, I'll thank her now, Aileen, uh, for putting this together. Um, it's very hard to organize even you know, a one venue program, but to do it across two sites, it takes an awful lot of organization. We've had a really good turnout here and also in Uri, so I'd just like to thank her for doing that. And without further ado, I think we'll have Osmond um, do his first talk. With the appointment of Caroline as our third consultant here, the services change slightly, and palliative care and the palliative medicine team are still very much a Cinderella service, so we tend to think everyone kind of knows how we've changed and how we've modified and how the referral systems now go. And to be honest with you, sometimes that isn't the case. So technically with the three of us, we rotate around on a monthly basis, and that sounds really disruptive, but it actually has fairly positive components for ourselves. There's a month spent within the hospice, which is our acute inpatient unit. As you know, it's 14 beds. We get in about sort of 300 to 400 admissions a year. We would have maybe about 100, 120 deaths a year. So technically that's where we do the bulk of our work, our acute work. That's where the difficult patients from Craig Avon and Daisy Hill and from South Throne will eventually end up if they have problems and can't be managed in the community. Um, with the appointment of Caroline, remember, we felt that there was a big need there for community to be beefed up from our point of view. We could provide extra support, both for the nursing teams and for the GPs, and we've tried to do that as well. So technically, the service is composed of the inpatient unit, as I've already said. It's also composed of the ward rounds, basically, in Daisy Hill and Craig Avon. Um, they will occur nearly on a daily basis. Um, our list would vary from anything from sort of 20 to 30 patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the referrals will be made not simply because someone has cancer or a life-limiting illness or requires palliative needs, but whether or not the actual admitting team will refer this patient on to us. And the reason we insist on that is that it keeps everything very clean for us. It makes sure that the surgeons or the haematologists actually know we're involved and actually agree to our involvement and then know what we're doing. So there's better lines of communication with that. We have had instances where we've turned up and then been asked to just to uh, help with pain management or nausea or confusion or whatever, only to find that someone said, oh, this patient's actually had curative surgery and therefore doesn't really warrant any input. And so to avoid that at all, if they're in hospital, it's the consultant in charge of the team here will actually make the referral to ourselves and we'll gladly go and see them at any stage. Likewise, if the patient's in community, the GP has to sanction that referral, even if it's only verbal through the Macmillan teams or the specialist palliative care nurses out there. The GP will, we will not go and see a patient unless that particular patient's GP has actually sanctioned the referral. For the same reason, 
we have had one or two instances where we've turned up on a doorstep to see a patient and a GP has actually arrived and said, what are you doing? Here? I can manage the situation. And that's exactly what we hope to achieve, that you guys are managing it. And if you need the input, if you need the extra support, if you need a bit of advice, then fine, that's what we're there for. To try to facilitate that, um, we have introduced just a, a, a direct access phone. It's a mobile phone. They give us one between the three of us, but still, it's usually in one place and it usually is charged. It's on between 12 and 1. While it's not ideal, it is really a clear cut time and a place where you should be able to access ourselves for just advice. The normal referral pathways still exist. So if you need a patient seen at the clinic, you can contact Craig Avon here, contact the palliative care secretary based in the mandible unit, and that patient will be slotted in. We don't have a huge waiting list. So for urgent cases, they're usually seen very quickly if they're willing to travel. So we run clinics here in Craigavon on a weekly basis, in South Tyrone on a weekly basis, and in Daisy Hill on a monthly basis. Um, the reason Daisy Hill is monthly is the trust won't actually allow us to expand to a weekly basis because they, they felt that the community-based side of the care has to be improved and they could not see that patients who are actually living in the community, accessing care from their GP, being visited by the Macmillan nursing teams and having input at different stages. If they come to a clinic, the clinic is based in a hospital, so they don't see that as a community-based service, which I think is absolute madness. So we're running on one clinic a month in Daisy Hill, which again, from our numbers, we, we really like to see it increase to at least sort of every two weeks or, or certainly weekly. I think the numbers we'd, we'd hold up with that. So your patients can still be seen at outpatients fairly quickly. As I say, we don't have the, the, the vast sort of waiting times. Um, you can also access ourselves directly here because usually we're on the wards or in hospice. Hospice is 24 hour medical cover anyway, seven days a week. So you'll always get access through. If you push hard, you have to get through reception, then you have to get through the ward, then you have to get through the medical officer. And if he or she thinks can't help you, then you go through, there's always a consultant second on call. So 24 seven, seven days a week, we are available. We can be there. I prefer not to be driving around the countryside, going out to see someone, but it does happen. And we are available for domiciliary visits as well. Our numbers of domiciliary visits aren't really huge. And I think that's probably a reflection on the success of the clinics. With the clinics, we tend to, as I say, see the patients, try to establish a framework that you guys can hopefully run with, and more importantly, try to get that information back to the Macmillan nursing teams and yourselves as quickly as possible. Now, they spend an absolute fortune on a computerized dictation system, but it goes sometimes, letters disappear and disappears off into the ether. But we do try to get our letters out fairly promptly within a few days. They have to be typed, they have to be posted out the old way. They won't let us actually email this stuff to you. So invariably, when the patients are seen by ourselves at Clink, you'll get a, an ask handwritten note sort of saying roughly what we've done, what the issue was, and any changes in the medications, and then the letter will follow up. We would like feedback. We get very little feedback from you guys. If there's a problem, we get lots of feedback. But generally, if things aren't working the way we think they're working, we would love to get it back because we can change and alter things. We're small enough to actually change what we do without altering the service completely. And little adjustments can make a big difference to you guys. We very much try, we're not lazy, and well, I hope we're not, but we very much try to keep you guys in the loop because I think often gen general practitioners are, are left out of the loop from breaking news to patients. We've actually had patients sent to the outpatients clinics to be told their diagnosis. And this is after someone's been referred up for a, for a tertiary referral, had investigations, scans, probably had a few biopsies along the way, had seen either surgical or medical teams, and yet, Somewhere along the line, they bounce into us saying, well, what's, what's actually wrong? And I think that's completely wrong. I think you guys should be involved and have the opportunity with the, the information at hand and all the results available to get involved and bring, you know them better. You've taken them through this process anyway. They've come to you with the initial problems. And I think sometimes the, some of the surgeons especially might feel that sort of offhand, and not all of them, but it does happen on occasions. And I just think that maybe what we do isn't exactly fully understood sometimes by some of the other specialist teams, but we do try. Um, I'd say the bulk of the work remains our inpatient unit. And the slight problem with that is that it's still a voluntary organization, the 14 beds, it's fully integrated, but sometimes again, it's not seen to be fully integrated. We still have a, a, a lab bill coming in for something like 16,000 pounds a year for patients that have been transferred from Kirkavon or Daisy Hill Hospital into an acute specialist unit. So for us to do an MRI scan, there suddenly we're being billed. Now we haven't paid that in X years, but it's still the concept of actually billing us for doing investigations. 
and you know, the alternative for us is to pack a patient into an ambulance, send them over to a &E, get the procedures done and then take them back again. And that just does not make sense in any way, shape or form. But despite that, the general, the bulk of the work remains in our inpatient unit and that's where you'll find us actually most of the time. Um, outside of that, we have tried to provide extra support. We don't run and organise the community teams. They are very efficient. They run themselves. They link in. They have good and bad relationships with you as you have with them at times. But we did feel that perhaps we weren't giving them enough support. And with Caroline's appointment as well, we've been able to have designated times allocated to support the teams. I would do two days a week, two morning sessions with the Macmillan team in Daisy Hill. Try to get down in Lurgan as well, two sessions a week, and South Tyrone, one session a week. Now South Tyrone, the clinic is actually um, performed as well with the, one of the Macmillan, a rotating Macmillan nurse from the community. So we actually have two opportunities a week anyway to meet with them. They're able to discuss any difficult patients that they have during those times. We try to formalize it a little bit more as well. And sometimes we've, some of them are better taking notes and describing exactly what sort of patients they have. But we've become, I think, a little bit more accessible to them. And I have to say, there was a, a worry from our part that maybe we'd be slightly overloaded with sort of queries and, and that hasn't really happened. I think the teams are incredibly professional and they highlight if they're worried and anxious about a patient and they need a bit of help and support, then that's exactly what we're there for. So we try to give them a bit more structure during the week and try again to make ourselves more available outside of those two days a week uh, for, for access to additional information <laughs> and support that goes on. Um, so I, basically the, the format again has not really altered. If you need an acute admission to the inpatient unit, if patients have perhaps been into the inpatient unit before, and the main reasons remain symptom management, which would be our main one, um, respite relief for families, and, and terminal care. And I said about a third of the patients coming into the unit will actually die within the unit. And some of those have been in several times, maybe been transfused, had a paracentesis, pleural aspiration, whatever, gone back out again. Uh, they may have just their drugs and their medications altered or changed. And again, we try to provide some sort of framework for, to make it a little bit easier for out of hours and for yourselves to actually work with that. But it's far from perfect. I think there was a, a consensus that if a third consultant was put into place, that all these admissions going through casualty, sort of um, Friday evenings or in the early hours of Sunday morning, that we just stop. And that is never going to happen. Because I'm sure you all know that any patient can be reasonably well controlled, in fact, very well controlled, and sometimes the family just cannot manage. And I think that's a very valid reason for actually admitting a patient. If the patient has to be admitted, I still don't see why it's such an issue to come through casualty, to find a bed here. With the teams here in both the main hospitals within the trust, they will be seen by, have some palliative input throughout the week. And if they do need to tra be transferred to the hospice for extra specialist care, then that can be arranged at an appropriate time. Hospice, they can be admitted directly if there's beds available. But with 14 beds, and we run on, I think, about 90% occupancy, we have an average length of stay of about 11 days. So we're one of the most acute units within the UK. And we turn our beds over very, very rapidly. We try to get the job done as well as we can. And of course, we have problems. Patients are reluctant to come in because it's hospice and they feel as if they're going to die. They may be reluctant then, once they are in for a while, they actually leave because they actually quite like it here and they feel quite secure and they've got lovely nurses who do all the bits and pieces for them. So we, we have to sort of balance up both ends of that. We're very, very fortunate from we don't have additional services usually, but we can access and expedite the services that are there. And we, we've had a few increasing problems now trying to make sure care packages and stuff are in place, exactly like the, the uh, um, the hospitals here as well. Sometimes they just don't arrive on time or the amount of stuff that we've been promised isn't there. And we do have issues with that when patients get home, there's a certain element of dissatisfaction after being very satisfied with the, the amount of sort of symptom management that we've got. So I'm fairly limited in what I'm allowed to talk about. So I will move on to um, Tracy and Caroline, who, as Jerry had said, are going to talk about so life after the Liverpool Curve pathway, some of the ethical issues, and we'll highlight maybe some difficult symptom management, and then the discussion at the end, we're very open to uh, any questions, difficulties, any difficult cases that you've had, you want to bounce <coughs> off us as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, hands up anybody who was glad to see the back of the LCP. A few, a small minority, that might make for some discussion later. 
My hands are firmly down. Um, I did think it was a great document when used properly and personally didn't have any bad experiences of it. Um, but as we know, many, many people across the UK did have bad experiences of it um, and we're vocal about that and the media had a field day with that. So the kind of things we read are um, mum denying, denied chance to say goodbye, hospitals bribed, um, are they playing God and patients or families not being told about it. So lots of dispute about um, difficult around difficulties around the LCP and really when, when it comes down to it the three main issues were really that um, the families weren't being told that the patient was on the pathway. The second thing was that the pa patients were being put in the pathway who maybe weren't actually genuinely dying and then the third really big deal was that it was perceived that fluids were being automatically stopped and patients were, were were dying of dehydration. So there were some valid points there and there were definitely some incidences when things when th things did go wrong um, with the pathway. So this prompted a, rev a, a national review of the Liverpool Care Pathway um, and the, the re response from that review unfortunately instead of recognising that it's a good document when used properly and put more resources into enabling it to be used properly such as support and education Unfortunately, it was advised that the, the pathway should be phased out and that did happen about a year ago. Um, and what they recommended as, as a, an outcome of the review was that there should be five principles of looking after patients at the end of life that we should adopt for every patient who is dying. And those principles were, first of all, identifying that the patient actually is dying, that we commun communicate well with the patient if appropriate and with the family, um, and that we identify the holistic care needs for the patient at the end of life, and that the focus in the last days of life is around symptom control rather than active treatment, and also supporting families and carers prior to death and in, into bereavement. So this is the kind of thing that we all do every day. So I want to be careful not to tell you how to do the job that you do very well, but I think it's probably helpful for us to just look at those principles and just go through um, what each of those mean for each of us. So the first principle is that we, um, there should be timely identification that the person is dying. So we need to know that the patient is deteriorating, that we're expecting them to die, that we're not looking at a deterioration here that's reversible. If it's something reversible, we treat the... Rev the reversible nature of it and then reassess rather than assuming the patient is dying um, and that's sometimes difficult to do and sometimes it's easy to identify when somebody's reaching the end of their life sometimes it's not so that really should be a multidisciplinary decision um, and we need to make sure that, that we then move on from that decision and make, uh, and make further decisions about what treatment is appropriate for the patient what interventions are the right thing and record our reasons why for that and then make a plan for managing this specific patient. The second principle is around communication. Um, we communicate these details with the family if appropriate, but as we know, it's not always appropriate to do that. But it is appropriate to communicate with the family that their relative is dying so that they're aware of what to expect and they're not shocked when they do die, particularly when it's something that we expect. Um, and, but we also bear in mind that it is difficult to predict that and we don't know when somebody's going to die and we need to advise the best we can, but also um, make it clear that it is uncertain and we don't know and we just need to keep reassessing, reviewing and updating them with the information as we have it. The third principle is really around identifying the patient's holistic needs and making sure that those, are, those needs are met and that really is in a multidisciplinary team environment using all the members of that team and, and that a plan is made for the patient for their specific needs involving the specific disciplines that they need. Fourth, fourth principle is around um, focusing on symptom management and comfort care at the end of life and really trying to be careful in decisions about what other interventions are appropriate. So knowing when to stop taking blood, stop doing x-rays, stop giving antibiotics or other treatments, knowing when it's just about managing symptoms and that we're genuinely reaching a very natural end of the patient's life. And as part of that, um, certainly in hospital, we, we need to be addressing um, resuscitation status and, and discussing with patients if appropriate or with families that this patient is nearing the end of their life, that they are reaching a natural end of life, that resuscitation will not change that and therefore it wouldn't be appropriate and, <coughs> and, and won't be done. Um, we also need to talk through other interventions, like I've mentioned antibiotics, bloods, um, other investigations and why they will or won't be done and in what situations it would be appropriate to do those and, and make a plan and, and record that. Um, and assessing patients individually regarding nutrition and hydration and making sure that patients are receiving fluid or supported in having oral food and fluids and if they can't take orals that they're assessed as to whether um, intravenous or subcut fluids are appropriate for them and only withholding them if it's right to do that.
Um, and just bearing in mind that symptom management and comfort are really the priority through all of this. And then the last principle is about supporting families and carers when the patient's ill and also after the patient die and, and into bereavement, giving them the appropriate information and supporting them in the best way. So um, although it is stuff that we all do every day, without a document and a bit of a checklist, it is hard to do it consistently and it's hard to make sure that we do all aspects of that. Um, and that's certainly feedback that we received within the trust, that there were senior um, medical staff within the trust that felt that with the loss of the Liverpool Care Pathway that they felt their dying patients weren't getting cared for as well as what they thought they should be. So we got together as a group to see how do we address this, how do we create something that allows allows us to be prompted about all of those things that we need to do but not have it in such a, a strict format as a pathway that we would run into potentially the same problems as we ran into with the Liverpool Care Pathway. So we did develop some trust guidance um, and it's really based on those five principles um, to outline how we manage patients at the end of life. Now at the minute this is within the trust environment so I don't want to go into too much detail. You, there are some copies here <coughs> that you can have a look at, I don't know if there's one for everybody. But it's not something being used within the community, but I think a lot of the principles are very applicable to the community. So I just wanted to make you aware of it and, and discuss really what's, what the priorities in it are. So really the start of it is guidance on how to develop a care plan. And, and that really is about identifying the right patient to be on it. And it's just what I've just said about making sure the patient is dying and it's not a reversible deterioration. Um, and then there's a really useful page on guidance on how to discuss dying with patients and their families. I'll come back to that in a wee bit more detail in, in a couple of minutes. Um, the principles I've just gone through and then there's a couple of checklists that I don't think we need to go into detail on tonight um, and then at the, towards the end of the document there's a really good piece on symptom management guidelines and I'm going to talk a wee bit more about that later, later on this evening. So the page near the start about discussing dying with patients and their families and carers, I've just highlighted that because it's just some really useful um, guidance as to how we have those difficult conversations. So things like making sure that we talk to the to the patient and family about the focus of care now being on their comfort um, and and their dignity and not not on interventions that are not going to make a difference to their prognosis. And if a patient has previously stated a wish in an advanced care plan or something similar, that we take that on board and try our best to facilitate the patient's wishes. Um, it also encourages us to talk about medications and that some medications are now burdensome for the patient and are not necessarily helpful. So a lot of their cardiac medications, cholesterol medications, vitamins, um, things like that, that it's just a burden for them to take and we know that they're not going to change the, the prognosis for the patient at this time. Um, and also to highlight to relatives that things like regular observations and other and blood tests and x-rays and things like that, this may not be in their best interest now in, in many cases and again more burdensome and we need to be sure that everything we do is going to change the man management for the patient and if it's not going to change it, there's no point in putting the patient through things unnecessarily. I think we need to make sure that we highlight to relatives that as the patient nears the end of life that they will lose interest in eating and drinking and that's very natural. Their body needs less, their body's doing less and hunger and thirst are less of, less of an issue and that provides a lot of reassurance for, for families because there's often an awful lot of anxiety around the fact that people aren't eating and drinking and Caroline will touch on that a wee bit more in her talk as well. Um, and again I've already mentioned resuscitation and sometimes we get very caught up with talking to relatives and getting permission not to not not to, not to provide resuscitation but really in this sort of scenario a patient is naturally dying resuscitation is not going to change that and, it, it, and it's not it's not dignified for the patient uh, and it's about wording it to to the family that this is not an appropriate intervention and this is why we wouldn't be providing it um, and always, always remembering that prognostication is difficult we think somebody may be dying within 24 hours and they're still with us five or, five or six days later they're still dying but it just doesn't always happen in the time scale that we think so we just need to be careful and always really assess and always um, just l let people know that things could change and just review that. So in summary, we need to recognise the patient's dying, we need to communicate appropriately with patient and family, um, involve them in the assessment and the decisions, support them through everything and make specific plans for those patients and, and carry, carry through with those plans. And remembering that how people die, is a, this is a really important time in these families' lives and they're going to remember this for the rest of their lives. So I'm going to step down now and let Caroline do her bit. 
later on in the evening I am going to be doing a wee bit on symptom control and um, so while we're talking I would appreciate it if any of you can think of any difficult situations that you have had of um, difficult symptom control of patients at the end of life because I think it'd be much better if we had a few examples to talk through from yourselves rather than rather than me just giving examples so if anything comes to mind no pressure if it doesn't but just as you're thinking over things okay thank you Hello everybody, I'm Caroline, I'm the third consultant. I was appointed um, in September last year, so some of you have, I know and some of you don't, so it's nice to meet you today. Um, I always hate it when they give me the ethics presentation to anybody who isn't a medical student because anybody who's been working for any length of time will have encountered lots of ethical dilemmas and will have dealt with it extremely well. And also, as the slide says, it's all grey. I don't have any great answers today, so I'm sure you're probably thinking, well, why should I listen, why should I stay, is there any point? Sometimes it's good to know there isn't a right answer. Sometimes it's good to have permission to know that there isn't a right answer. And sometimes it's useful to have a framework when you are faced with that unique ethical situation to think, well, how could I go through these things to try and find an answer? So that's, that's really the point of what I'm trying to talk about today. Um, so the learning objectives are that <coughs> think about clinical ethics in our daily practice, to think about different ethical frameworks that we probably learned as medical students and we would maybe or maybe not remember, to discuss how end of life care, how palliative issues tie into ethical frameworks. And then to touch a little bit on autonomy and dignity and futility of treatment and truth telling and those sorts of things. But it's tough and in palliative care it's particularly tough because there's a whole host and that, I ran out of room on my slides so I couldn't put anything else on, but Issues about feeding patients, about when we give fluids, when we don't give fluids, how we get the best interests of that patient, what do we do when the surgeon wants to do one thing and we want to do something else and the family wants to do a third thing, how do we find a way ahead? Really tough emotive cases. I've had a real run lately of women in their mid-30s with small children who've had terrible diagnoses and have had really difficult deaths and that's always very difficult for everybody involved. What we do when the family are at each other's throats and the patient's in the middle of it all and how do we not get tied into it and remember that the patient's the focus of care. What we do when patients don't have capacity to make decisions. Issues about resuscitation which Tracy has mentioned and I'll talk a bit more on and also withholding treatments or withdrawing treatments at the end of life. So there's a whole host of things that, that we encounter in daily practice in palliative care and you will all have encountered in, in, in GP. I really tried to find, I, I, that was the most decent slide of Fifty Shades of Grey that I could put up. Although if I had thought about it, it's almost the watershed, I maybe could have gone a bit further, but that's the best I could do. So traditional ethical theories, this is a bit dry, but it, it gets a bit more interesting in a minute. So deontology, and I only learned about this when I was doing my master's at, at Cardiff, I hadn't heard of it before, but um, this is a theory whereby it means the intention of what you're doing is most important and that some moral principles are not negotiable under any circumstance. And I'll talk about it in more detail in a wee second. Utilitarianism or consequentialism it tends to be what we as doctors do and certainly is what people when they're planning, commissioners when they're planning services tend to do. So they look at the outcome and sometimes at the end will justify the means. And then virtue theory, which is my favourite one, which means you challenge both of those. You don't really like either, so you're, you're trying to find a different way. So I'm going to have a show of hands to copy Tracy to see where your moral philosophy is at half past seven on a Thursday night. Um, okay, so 30 mile an hour speed limit. If you're a deontological person, you're going to say 30 miles an hour is the maximum. The law is paramount. I'm going to follow the law. Any deontological thinkers? Nope. Great. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Consequentialist will say, well, you don't get done. It's, you know, the speed limit plus 10%. You don't get done if you do up to 33. I got done doing 33, just as a disclaimer, but you don't get done for 33. So you can go under 34. Anybody think like that? Okay. Oh, gosh. Something bad happened then. Right. And then the virtue, virtuous person says, well, 30 miles per hour if it's normal circumstances, but if it's a real life-threatening emergency, I'm going to push it to 35. Anybody like that? Oh, oh, that's lovely. Okay. Most people were consequentialists, but it's good to know there's people with lots of virtue out there. That's great. Okay, it's going to get a bit harder now. Tougher decisions. You're trekking in the Andes and you come across a hostage situation. 20 villagers are held hostage and the guerrilla leader gives you a choice. If you shoot one person, he will spare the other 19. But if you don't, if you say, I'm not going to shoot anybody, then he's going to kill everyone. Okay? So what would you do? I'm sure if that's negotiable. Maybe that's virtue theory, is it? We're, we're thinking outside the box. Okay. So 
If you're a deontological thinker, you're going to say, I'm not going to shoot because it's always wrong to shoot an innocent person. So it doesn't matter what the outcome is and it's not my fault if he shoots all 20, it's nothing to do with me. So that's what the deontological thinker thinks. Anybody think like that? No, same again, okay. The consequentialist, well, okay, if I shoot one person, then I save 19, so that's really good. So the greater good has been achieved. Anybody, anybody there? Yeah, it's not, it's not bad, you know, 19 alive for one death. Um, and then the virtuous person who's going to say, how would those actions reflect on my character? And perhaps I could find a, a better way, I could show more courage and I could save everybody. Who's virtuous? Yes. Okay. So there's lots of different ethical theories. But I think partly because deontological and consequentialist is really hard to say at a presentation at half past seven at night when you've been on the go since 5 a.m. with my daughter, there's biomedical ethical theory, which we're probably all more familiar with as, as part of medical student training. So if we think of a person's autonomy, we put the patient at the centre of our care and think how do we involve them in decisions. We practice non-maleficence, we don't want to harm anybody we're looking after. We practice beneficence, we want to do good and we practice justice, we make sure that the needs of our patients are balanced with the needs of greater society. So we'll talk about those a bit more as we go through the slides. Okay, so what is a good death? Lots of images if you Google good death. And I think we'd all acknowledge that all looks pretty good. People with their, people they love, with their pets, family around them, all those things. So back in 2000, um, there was a study done looking at what patients, what family physicians and what other care providers thought was important to achieve a good death. So control of symptoms, and I know Tracy will talk about that a little bit later. Preparing patients and preparing their families that death is coming. Having an opportunity for people to feel closure and a sense of completeness with their life and having a really good relationship with the people who are looking after them. So we would know those things. So how do we get that good relationship? Well, I think I like this from the end of life strategy of 2008. The dignity, how we care for the dying is an indicator of how we care for all sick and vulnerable people. And it's a measure of society as a whole and it is a litmus test for health and social care. And I think particularly with the direction of travel with the government, with Jeremy Hunt and his proclamations, I think this is really important at the minute. I like this. So truth-telling, a big part of ethical theory. And when I was preparing the slide, I thought, should I tell you that this afternoon I had planned to look at this whole presentation in great detail, but the hospice went a little bit wrong this afternoon, so that didn't happen. So that's my truth. So are lies sometimes acceptable to tell patients? Are certain types of lies more acceptable than others? Is it acceptable to tell a lie to stop somebody from harming themselves? Lies of any form are wrong? Or lies designed to ease the distress of the individual are acceptable. What do you think? Pa all lies are wrong. No. Okay. Okay. So often patients will say to me, "Just promise me I won't have any pain at the end." I can't promise a hundred percent that they won't, but I don't think I'd say that. I think I'd say that I'd do my very best, and we'd all do our very best to do everything we could to keep you as comfortable as we can. So I'm, technically I'm probably lying because I can't guarantee it. We know a small portion of cancer patients will have pain when they die. We don't treat all pain. So I've no right answers. You're all looking at me. I've no right answers, but things we have to face. Collusion, particularly important with truth telling. If my next of kin asked for information to be withheld from me, I wouldn't be very happy. And we constantly hear, doctor, please don't tell granny. We know her better. She'll turn her face to the wall and that'll be the end of it. So what do we do then? Um, Tracy and I have just finished doing advanced communication skills training of the trust last week and, and this came up a lot, certainly in my group, that, that people really struggled with this one. They sat in clinic and they had the patient and the relative maybe a foot behind the patient who said, don't say cancer, don't say the C word, and, and, ha and what you do there. How do you go forward? Is it about trying to get to the bottom of what the relative's worries are? How you do that subtly, trying to explain that if the patient doesn't trust us, if the patient has an idea that we're lying, we're withholding things, then the whole doctor-patient relationship has gone, the trust has gone. So how do we go forward? Life prolonging treatment, certainly when Osmond and Tracy and I are working in the hospitals, we, we see this a lot and sometimes we're called in whenever things have got a bit difficult as to how to make decisions about withdrawing treatment. And how do we define it? Well, any medical intervention, any procedure, any medication which is administered to benefit the patient and to forestall the moment of death is a life prolonging treatment. So we're sort of thinking about ventilation, artificial ventilation, nippy, um, artificial nutrition and hydration, hugely topical at the moment. Resuscitation, 
whether somebody should have hemodialysis and whether antibiotics are appropriate at the end of life. And often I'll see in the notes I'll arrive and I'll have written medically futile, therefore not given, but it's never been discussed with a patient, it's never been discussed with a family, so there's all these issues about why these things haven't been considered. So there's lots of ways we can define medical futility. Is it a lethal diagnosis or prognosis of imminent death? Pretty futile. A therapy that cannot achieve its um, physiological goal? A therapy that cannot achieve a patient or a family's goal? Is that futile to them or to us? A therapy that cannot enhance the patient's quality of life? Or a therapy that will extend a patient's lifespan by only a few days? All of those statements can be used to describe medical futility depending on where you're coming from. CPR. Often I'll see patients in the acute hospital who are actively dying and there hasn't been a resuscitation decision made. So technically if that patient were to die and we know it's entirely predictable, we know what's going to happen, the resuscitation team will be called in the hospital. Hugely inappropriate, hugely distressing for the family and for the staff. <coughs> So the facts about CPR, it was developed in the 60s. It was intended for sudden cardiac arrest, usually monitored sudden cardiac arrest, not actively <coughs> predictable dying patients. Positive predictors were, as I said, people on monitors, people who were young and fit and who had maybe had a sudden arrhythmia, who'd had an MI. Um, the in-hospital success was about four in 10, but only two in 10 survived to discharge. So success is defined as restoring circulation, restoring spontaneous breathing but actually real success is being well enough to go home again, so that was two in 10. But in advanced cancer patients and the patients that we look after all the time in palliative care, the success rate is less than 1%. So is that medically futile? Well, that's not what the public think, unfortunately. Now this is an old journal, this is back from 1996, and you'll see by the programs it looked at, ER, Chicago Hope. Now I remember the first two, Rescue 911 was before my time, but anyway. So they had 60 episodes of resuscitation and 97 episodes, but 65% of those resuscitated were children or teenagers or young adults. So again, not the patient population that we would regularly see. Three quarters survived the arrest and nearly 70% survived a discharge. So hugely unrealistic, but yet that's what the public see. They don't see the patient with a widespread bony mets who some enthusiastic junior doctor jumps up and down on their chest and breaks every rib and feels every rib they break and goes with that through their career. And they don't see the family standing outside when they should be by the bedside. But th this is what they see, this is what they hear. So why is there controversy over artificial nutrition and hydration? Why is it wrong to feed people? Why is it wrong to give people fluids? Why is it an issue? Food is love. Fluids are love. We live in Ireland. People give you a cup of tea and a wee bun and that fixes everything. So we don't want to take that away. And our friends in the media don't like us when we mention anything to do with this. So this is why it's so controversial. But again, it falls into areas of medical futility. Is it okay if somebody's dying and they can't swallow any more? Is it okay to think, my goodness, we must put a peg tube in their stomach? Is that okay so that they get lots of food? Or is that medically futile? Is it okay to keep giving fluids to a patient who's got increasing respiratory secretions and is becoming increasingly distressed because the family or think may be directed by the media that if we stop the fluids, we're dehydrating them, we're letting them die terribly thirsty, we're letting them die in agony. Is that okay? Is that futile? Does that cause harm? All things to think about. So what do we do when we're faced with that? Well, we think, will it help them? I have a real strict rule about fluids. I don't argue with any family over fluids because I think it's at the end of somebody's life, this is not the conversation that you want to be having with a family. This is not what you want them to remember. And my rule is, if it's not harming the patient, that's fine with me. If the person has a Venflon and the Venflon tissues, usually I will try and negotiate that if there's a real insistence for fluids and the patient isn't distressed, we'll put them up subcutaneously. I wouldn't put somebody through another cannulation, but I think that's a way for patients to get fluids. Similarly, if I have a patient who's very bubbly and who's very rattly and I'm filling them with hyacine and I've got a bag of fluid running, I will be explaining to our family that I now think we've reached the point where the harm is actually worse. It's worse for the patient. And as Tracy said, we know as people die, they, they're not as thirsty. They don't need the same amount of fluid. So I would explain those things. But unless, to be honest, I saw a person who was really distressed from too much fluids, I, I don't fight with families. I just reduce the volume and let it run because that's not what you want people to remember, that somebody was, was left to be dehydrated and died thirsty, particularly with Stafford and drinking from jugs and all those things. That's, that's not what we want to feed into. Sometimes it can be really helpful to have a trial of treatment. I had a man in Craig Avon that Tracy was involved with as well not so long ago. He had widespread malignancy and on paper looked really poorly but wasn't too bad physically. 
and really, really wanted artificial feeding, couldn't, couldn't eat properly. And in the end, after a lot of negotiation, it was agreed a three-day trial to see if it made things better. And I think we all knew it didn't, and it wouldn't, and it didn't, but it gave him and it gave his family closure. And I think if we hadn't done that, not only would they have had a really tough bereavement and a really tough grief to deal with, I think we probably would have had to deal with them with complaints and, and all sorts of things. And that's not why we did it. We didn't do, do it to, to not have hassle down the, the road, but it gave them closure. So there was benefit in that. Does it maintain hope? Hope's good. I work in palliative care and I don't like to take people's hope away. I like it when people come to my clinic and they're, they're quite content when they leave. You know, sometimes a little bit of hope is good as long as it's realistic hope. Can those things prolong death? Well, the essence of palliative care is that we don't want to hasten death, but equally we don't want to prolong the dying process. And if we're feeding somebody artificially, when normally that person would be getting sleepier and drowsier and not eating, maybe we are prolonging the dying phase and maybe that's not correct. Is that futile? Is that doing harm? And then we always have to make sure before we start anything, like the gentleman I had who had the trial of artificial feeding, the limits. We clearly negotiated at the start what we were doing, why we were doing it, and what the duration was. So everybody was on the same page. It was a contract that we entered into. So what's most important after everything I've said? Talking. Um, I find that if you talk to people and you explain where you're coming from and why you're doing it and what you're thinking about, you don't go too far wrong. I don't always get the pain relief right the first time. I don't always get the syringe driver right. But I think if you talk to people and you remember that you're just two people and one of you might be a doctor and one of you is the person of cancer, but it's just two people in a room. And as long as you have that honest, open discussion, I don't think you go too far wrong. When I started in palliative care now, 12 years ago, the first thing I was told, I came from a cardiology background, was to sit down, slow down and shut up. And I thought that was really, really good advice and that stayed with me. And when I hear myself, not in this situation, but when I hear myself with a patient talking too much, I know I need to stop and let them talk. And I like this too. We must refrain from doing things merely because we know how to do them. That's really good when the juniors come to me and they've grown a sputum sample on somebody who's got advanced lung cancer and it's sensitive to IV domestos and they're getting desperately excited. And yes, it's easy to do a cannulation and it's easy to get the drug, but should we do it? Is it the right thing to do? And it's not, this isn't new. Nothing I'm talking about is new. William Osler, a long time ago, I don't have a year, so I'm going to have to say a long time ago, said the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. That's good stuff. Um, GMC has lots of good articles about um, treatment at the end of life, and the, the, it's an electronic form as well as, as hard copy form. So I haven't given you any answers. I've just given you things to think about, but I hope that was okay. And if you want to talk about anything whenever we have our session at the end, I'll be glad. Thank you. We're just going to go ahead and do the symptom management at the end of life. Obviously, um, as GPs and um, obviously some of the nurses here who don't do palliative care all the time, uh, it's, it's hard for us sometimes because I haven't had a palliative care patient myself for about three or four months and it's supposed to be the thing I do, but we haven't actually had any and as sure as anything we'll have three or four in the next few weeks. And it, it's a big issue, symptom control, because at the end of the day, um, as we were talking about earlier, the last few days, it's very important to get everything right and it's about communication, it's about everything, but the bottom line is you have to be able to control the symptoms. And I must say one of the things I do and when we're teaching students we tell them is that if somebody's on the phone and they're looking to talk to you about a problem, get you out to the house, I always think I try and get as much information as possible about what they're actually de demanding and looking for on the phone so that I can go and look it up before I actually go out. And I, I've, I really think that's a good thing to do. And we use the, the little pocket handbooks and things like that that you all have. It's, it's a good idea. Um, it just means you walk into the house and you're in control. You're, you're not sort of on the back foot. And I think it's always, the other thing I always tell the students is, it's very important to try and scan around the house and try and get a feel for who's running the house. Because when you go out, there's usually one, it's usually a daughter-in-law or a daughter, and you, you can just tell that they're doing everything. And you, you make a beeline for them, and I always tell the students, look, actually go and tell them they're doing a great job, even if they're not particularly doing a great job. Because you want to get them on your side 
you know, the last person you want to talk to is the son-in-law from Belfast who's coming down with all the big ideas. You want to find the person who's doing it day in, day out, get them on side, and it makes your life so much easier. And, and you know, the whole idea is to become part of the whole process in the house, and you'll be welcome back. They trust you. That's part of the strength of general practice, I think, and also from the district nursing and Macmillan nursing point of view. You know, people get to know you, and you, you, you're part of the whole scene, and okay, you maybe step a wee bit back at the very end and just you know watch what's happening and you can jump in when needed uh, you don't want to be too intrusive but you know people are actually very happy to have you there in the house so Tracy's going to talk to us now about symptom control at the end of life I think you know at the end of the day that's what you live and die on is the symptom control at the end of life okay well we all know um, how difficult it can be sometimes to manage patients at the end of life in the community um, it's difficult enough in the hospice or hot or hospital um, but in the community it comes with its whole new set of challenges um, so I did want to just share one case with you of somebody who was particularly complex that we looked after uh, over the last few months all three of us were involved in this and um, it will probably live on in our memory for some time and there were probably there may well have been some of you involved in this as well there were quite a few professionals so she was 42 with metastatic ovarian cancer um, she developed bony mets in her spine and had radiotherapy but unfortunately the bony mets progressed after her radiotherapy so she went to have then surgery so she had posterior decompression and stabilization of her thoracic spine after surgery this was complicated by a malignant aroma developing over the site of surgery. This was quite large and caused really severe neuropathic pain. She'd been travelling to Belfast weekly um, to have a radiologist drain it on a weekly basis. She did get some relief and was very dependent on having that drained. Um, but she became too weak to travel to Belfast. So she then, um, she, had, she was in and out of hospice for a few short admissions, but didn't want to stay. So we made an arrangement that she came to hospice once a week to have this drained, but she wanted the rest of her management to be at home. Um, she had very severe neuropathic pain and very high levels of anxiety and agitation and extremely fearful about the future. She was on all of our neuropathic agents that we all know. So pregabalin, 250 milligrams BD, amitriptyline, 25 at night, and clonazepam, um, 0.5 milligrams at night. She was also on a syringe driver, um, and this had been titrated up over some time. We got to 500 milligrams of oxynorm, and then the volume became too big, so it had to be converted to diamorphine. Um, and it was converted over to 500, but then titrated up quite quickly, really in 100 milligram increments. So that in itself is probably frightening for us and maybe more so for you who's not maybe seeing it every day. Um, and we got as far as 800 milligrams of dimorphine in the syringe driver. She also had midazolam, which again was titrated in 10 milligram increments and we got up as far as 90 milligrams of that. She had um, ketamine orally um, for neuropathic pain and she got up as far as 60 milligrams four times a day orally. And then when she became weaker, that was also put in the syringe driver. Initially at 200 and then dropped down, 250 and dropped down to 200 milligrams. Mm. So despite all of that, she still needed multiple PRN medications. So she was using Oxynorm, 50 milligrams subcut, um, and she <coughs> tended to need those approximately three times in a 24 hour period. It was very variable, but it could be up to three times. And midazolam, she was using as well. We tried to encourage the family to give that, and we gave them buckle preparation so that they didn't need a health professional to be um, given it all of the time, but she did sometimes need subcut injections as well. And that could be maybe you know, one, two, three, up to five times in a 24 hour period. She did, she was successfully managed at home, um, which was her wish, um, but it was not easy for everybody looking after her because it really wasn't easy to control her symptoms. Um, she had very good care from her GP, um, district nurse, McMillan nurses. She had a number of domiciliary visits from the, the palliative medicine consultants and she attended hospice weekly as well. Um, and just before I was coming down here, Osmond and I were looking through her notes and looking through just out of interest in terms of out of hours um, uh, contacts with her. And I mean, the length was this, it was this long. Um, I, I, I stopped counting after I got a month prior to her death, we got to 23 contacts. Now, we were both quite shocked and I said, well, isn't that good she managed to stay at home um, with that many contacts? And then um, the half, the, the half uh, empty man said, well, that wasn't really very successful she had that many contacts. <laughs> so it's debatable whether that was good or not. But actually when I reviewed it, a lot of those contacts were actually Marie Curie contacts for, um, for going for breakthrough. So it wasn't all medical contacts.
complex, but still there's a significant enough number there. So that was a very complex case that we all, as a team, worked, worked together and um, wasn't perfect, but she died where she wanted to die with her family present um, in the difficult situation, probably as good as it could have been. Um, so I uh, wanted to highlight, highlight that to you. Um, I talked earlier about um, the sort of lack of and the, the sort of perceived decrease in care of dying patients after their loss of the LCP and really the biggest feedback was the loss of the guidelines that came attached to the back of the LCP really for managing those symptoms in the last day of life they were extremely useful and um, so because we didn't have access to the LCP then the, a, re a regional group of palliative medicine consultants tried to develop then really take those guidelines and just update them and make them available as a standalone document that you didn't need to have the pathway as part of it so we have put those on to the end of our guidance document but they, they also do stand as a, a standalone um, document and I think there's a copy for everybody here tonight um, to, bring, to bring home with you. So really the common symptoms we're dealing with in the last days of life are pain, nausea, shortness of breath, chest secretions and agitation. And the common drugs that we use for pain, morphine, diamorphine, oxynorm, for nausea, metoclopramide, cyclozine, possibly in combination with haloperidol or if they don't work, levomopromazine. For agitation, midazolam and if that's not enough on its own, add in levomopromazine. And for chest secretions, hyacine and glycopyronium. Um, drugs we're all probably very familiar with um, and really the purpose of my next five or ten minutes is really just to show you that these end of life care um, symptom control guidelines and just familiarize yourselves with them so that you're aware of what's in them, how to easily access the information. So it's not going to be very complicated. I have dreamt up a few very simple examples and it, the purpose of them is just to guide us through the document. So that's why I said to you earlier, if anybody has any scenarios that are real scenarios for you, this is a good chance to you know, a, a brief, we don't want to have anything too detailed, but brief just to help us look through the, the, the documents. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that anybody, that comes to mind for anybody? Yeah, we, we, one gentleman was uh, mid-60s with mesothelioma, and breathlessness was a significant concern, and he actually was admitted to the hospice within the last 24 hours of life because he was concerned that it was the anxiety associated with the breathlessness that was nearly a bigger problem than the actual breathlessness. <laughs> and he wanted the reassurance of knowing that there was somebody with an immediate contact to give him breakthrough. <laughs> and he, he didn't want a bad syringe driver. At that point, I think he accepted one once he got to the hospice from what I can understand, but um, he, he was very difficult. But, and that whole idea of, not just the breathlessness, but the anxiety that comes with them, the breathlessness and how you manage the two together. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And in terms of the, the guidance document, does, there, does everybody have a copy of it that we can flick through while we, while we talk? Um, I mean, I think that's, that's a very difficult situation. And what we'll be looking at here is, you know, on paper, how you manage the, the shortness of breath and how you manage the anxiety. But that, you know, that doesn't account for the fact that he's saying to you, oh, yes, you know, you're saying how to manage it with the syringe driver. I don't want one. Um, and I want to be in hospice. I want somebody to give me a subcut immediately. So we can plan the best we can, but we have to, we have to realise that patients have their preferences and things they want and don't want, and that limits us from doing what we want to do. He wanted to die at home. He didn't, or, or die in the hospital. He didn't want to die at home. He didn't want to be a burden on his wife. Yeah. Just the way he saw it. And that's probably very Which challenging. Is, because, it's interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting discussion you have. Because probably if he let you do what you wanted to do, you probably could have facilitated that. I think we probably could, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of even just kind of navigating our way around the guidelines, that you've probably all got them, the first page and the title, and then there's a sec really a section on each of the main symptoms. So if you move into it a few pages in, you get to the management of dyspnea page. Um, and um, it's a bit of a flow chart. I'm not going to go through it in real, in real detail, but in this kind of patient that we're talking about, it's the right-hand side. He's got persistent symptoms or distress. So we want to think, are they already taking morphine? Was he already on regular opioids? 
Yeah, so if he's already on regular opioids, if he's reaching the end of his life, symptoms are distressing, then we go down the, the yes route there, and that suggests giving a syringe driver with the opioids in it for manage, management of shortness of breath and ensuring that we've got breakthrough doses prescribed that are appropriate for exacerbations of that. And then if you move on down to the bottom bit, it says if they're breathless and anxious at the same time, then we want to add midazolam to that syringe driver and the suggested dose is 5 or 10 milligrams um, of that. So that's really how we... We find our way through that flow chart of how to manage breathlessness in that situation. Um, but as I say, that doesn't take into account for what then the patient is saying and, and how you have to do what is right in the situation with all the information that you have available. Any other things that come to mind? Patients who are vomiting, <coughs> the back end, they have a obstructive cause for their vomiting. I've had a couple of those and they're difficult to manage because yeah. um, the drugs, you know, the mechanical cause is there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so just in, we can chat about it as we look at the guidance, but in terms of the guidance, if you sort of it's kind of three pages into it, I think, is the management of nausea and vomiting page um, and it, it so we've got a patient here who has symptoms they are nauseated um, and um, it, it, it's talking about the use of a syringe driver and what what drugs would be used and we've got a list of all the, all the different drugs so I suppose the key thing in bowel obstruction is what what drugs are they already on and and probably the biggest thing for bowel obstruction is if metoclopramide is the drug that they're on that could exacerbate symptoms if they if they have a bowel obstruction because it'll increase the GI motility and, and make, make them more crampy so the first thing we'll do is to take take that out and replace that with other antiemetics. Oops. Um, so really on our list of antiemetics here, you know, the most common ones we use are metoclopramide, cyclozine and haloperidol. So metoclopramide is great if we've got poor gastric motility. If that's not the cause of the nausea and vomiting, cyclozine is a good option and then we add in haloperidol if we need to. So they're a great combination and that would probably be the most common combination that we would see in our patients at the end of life would be cyclozine with haloperidol added in and there's a good wee guide there about starting doses and then appropriate breakthrough doses. So we'd commonly have patients on maybe a syringe driver with 150 of cyclozine and make sure we've got haloperidol written up on a PRN basis. And then if that doesn't control the patient's nausea, then our second line antiemetic will be levomepromazine. So we will stop the first line and we'll replace it with the levomepromazine. And we normally start with a starting dose of 12.5 and titrate that, that up. Um, and would you stop the haloperidol breakthroughs as well? Um, we stop the and the haloperidol? We'll stop, the we'll stop it in the driver. We'll make sure we have some breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Usually if we've levomepromazine in the driver, we'll, we'll use levomepromazine breakthroughs as well. Um, but it, it depends what works for the patient. I mean, sometimes we'll have a few, a few <laughs> options there so that there's, there's uh, you know, if, if, if they don't settle. Um, on Danzeltron is down there at third line. We use it with caution just because it's very constipating and particularly with a bowel obstruction patient, well it depends whether if they're very obstructed, we're probably not going to make any difference, but um, you know, we do, we do, we are cautious, particularly in those patients who we think are at risk of obstruction. If we make them constipated, we're going to just increase the risk of that. Um, but it has its place, particularly if somebody's had radiotherapy or chemotherapy. The other thing, it's it's not on the guidelines, but if, if it is a bowel obstruction and the vomiting is because of a bowel obstruction, we use these medications, but if it is a mechanical obstruction, we're probably not going to stop. We might ease the sensation of nausea, but we're not going to stop the vomiting with these drugs. So our options at that point would be if the patient would accept an NG tube. A lot of patients don't want that. Um, if they don't, then we'll use octreotide in a second syringe driver. Um, and that will really just to be with the purpose of reducing the amount of secretions um, in, 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 the, in the stomach um, just to try and relieve symptoms. Um, that's the kind of patient who often will end up maybe coming to hospice, but you also might have them at home saying they don't want to come to hospice, and you know, but, but they can be really complicated and difficult to, to manage. But certainly NG tubes and octreotide are going to be the key things in terms of getting the vomiting reduced or stopped. Octreotide probably won't stop it, but even if it's manageable once or twice a day, there's a good compromise there. We've, we've had one or two patients where there's been a discussion about patches with subcutaneous morphine and not necessarily stopping the patches but adding in. Can you talk us through the, 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 the process of managing that? Because normally we would have come from a background that you use one or the other. Yeah. So how do, you know if patch has been successful up to a point but it's no longer successful, we've had one patient where we added in 
subcutaneous morphine and it did make a difference. Yeah. Well, I have to say it was the first time I'd ever heard of it being done and I was extremely nervous about doing it, mm -hmm. but it did work. So. Yeah, and that's one of the, the one of the cases I had chosen just to just to highlight. So it's the second one there, just to sort of very brief example, so the patient is on a, a mesolar patch of 100 micrograms, they're having breakthroughs of subcut diamorphine, um, they're getting 5 milligrams, if you look up the conversions that's probably too little, but they're getting breakthroughs of 5 milligrams, they've had 4 of them in the past 24 hours, they are reaching the end of their life. How will we manage that patient? So if you look through the guidelines here, um, the first couple of pages are on pain. Um, and the first page on pain has four options at the top and the very right hand option talks about patients who are already on fentanyl, butrans or transtech patch. So the top box is patients who are symptom, their symptoms are controlled, the bottom box is they're not controlled but basically the information is the same there so we're probably really in your patient we should go to the bottom box so they're already on a patch. So what we want to do is give stat doses of morphine or diamorphine for breakthrough which we've done in this case continue prescribing the patch and then if the patient is symptomatic and needing those breakthroughs we keep the patch going and we add in a syringe driver with with um, dimorphine what we commonly use a lot of these guidelines talk about morphine you may use morphine or dimorphine but you can calculate the conversions here but so in this case we will look at the last 24 hours they've needed four breakthroughs of five milligrams of diamorphine we'll probably add in a syringe driver with 20 milligrams of diamorphine in that alongside the patch and then over the coming days titrate up the dose of diamorphine based on how many breakthroughs the challenge here is what should the breakthrough be and in the next page of the pain guidelines there's a box at the bottom with all of the the fentanyl patches and we can then work out what the most appropriate breakthrough dose would be for for that patch dose. So if you go through the guidelines there, our 100 microgram patch, the subcut breakthrough of morphine, remember this morphine not diamorphine, is 20 milligrams. So I calculated out that that would really be about sort of 13 and a half milligrams of diamorphine. So we're looking at that as the appropriate breakthrough for the patch. We're then looking at the extra we've added in of the 20 milligrams of um, diamorphine and we're looking at six of that as the breakthrough as well and we're adding those both together to get an appropriate breakthrough and we're getting to somewhere between 15 and 20 milligrams of, of, of diamorphine as breakthrough. Now we do need to be cautious with that as well. But yeah, yeah, and I think I think in reality, I mean that's that's what the guidelines are saying. And I want to talk through what they're saying, but also I think we just need to remember that everybody deals with patches differently, and every patient absorbs patches differently. And certainly, part of the reason why we don't convert patches to a syringe driver at the end of life is because all all of these equivalences are so proximate, and every patient is different. And I've had so many patients that they're maybe on a hundred microgram patch, and you think they should be in this massive dose of dimorphine, and I get scared and start reducing the patch and increasing the dimorphine. And where we get to at the end is probably at least like a third of what you would expect if you looked at the books. So I would probably calculate all that that out and think, okay they probably should be due 15 or 20. They've had five, it hasn't really been effective, so I'll probably write up 10 to 15 and make sure 10's tried a few times and then try 15, so just be cautious with it all. Um, but it's just a guide as to what they might be able to tolerate, but if they haven't been using it, just work, work up to that. Um, but certainly, I think at any time, to convert a patch to a subcut or oral preparation is really difficult at the best of times. And when we've got a couple of days here, we just don't want to get it wrong. We're either going to give them too much and, and um, make them far too drowsy or we're going to give them too little and they're going to be in agony. It's never, it's never going to be effective. So definitely what you did was the right thing, adding it in, but just remembering then to, to think about the, the breakthroughs. Just the, the lesson from that experience for me was listen to your McMillan nurse. Because she got it spot on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She was absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, whenever I talk to the to the junior doctors about pain and talk about patches, I I almost throw up the patch slide just um, with with a comment of ask for help. You know, don't try to do this on your own if you haven't done it before because it, you'll get it wrong. And I I think the more I've seen the more weird I go around doing it because I get so scared because I have had too many bad experiences of just doing it by the book and getting it so wrong. You know. Um, so definitely, yeah, ask the McMillan nurse. <laughs> She'll probably come and ask us, but... <laughs> yeah, okay. Tracy, can I just ask you about, I get the confusion of the conversion of, if you have somebody maybe in a high dose of, of oral oxy, you know, oxycodone, and you want to revert it, and maybe in a certain type of somebody's deteriorate from that to morphine, 
is it is it like for like up to a certain dose? Yeah, I mean, it, what I would always do is, is, you know, when you've got something in oral oxycodone and you want to go to dimorphine, is just go through the, the steps back to morphine, probably. So, I mean, if you go in the second page of your guidelines there, you've got the oral, oral oxycodone and oral morphine. So if somebody says on 20 BD of oral oxy, oxycodone, so that's going to be 40, 40 of oral oxycodone, then that's going to be the equivalent of 80 of oral morphine um, and then we want to convert to diamorphine so then we'll divide that by three to get to, to dimorphine. There is some thinking that dimorphine and oxycodone in low doses are sort of equivalent in the syringe driver. So if I'm doing any of those conversions and trying to change drugs, I will probably calculate it out both ways. And you know, calculate it out back through morphine, go through all the steps, look at the equivalence between dimorphine and oxynorm, and then look at which is the more cautious and probably go with that. Or if they're sore, maybe step it up a wee bit but just always be careful. We can always review it the next day and increase it. We, we just don't want to go in there with too much at once. But you'd probably not go too far wrong just using this and going back through morphine and calculating it right that way. And if somebody's on oral oxycodone and you're going to change them to a driver, is it preferable to change them to try and convert them to morphine or diamorph? Or is it better to keep with oxycodone in the driver? Usually if patients are on oral oxycodone, so oxycontin or long tech, if you're converting to a driver just because they're not swallowing anymore um, and they're nearing the end of life, we will convert to oxynorm in the driver, so just keep the same drug. Um, if we, the reason for converting opioids will be if the patient is on a preparation of oral opioid and they're getting toxic, but the opioid is still the drug of choice. So you can't really decrease the drug because they're still sore. Um, so we switch it over to, to a different opioid at that point. Does that make sense? Maybe I'm not explaining that very well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's where this table is helpful, just in terms of if you want to change the drug to another opioid just to get the right, the right dose. We've had a few instances in the hospitals, often in the surgical wards, where somebody's been on MST, 20 milligrams BD, and, um, or Oxycontin, 20 milligrams BD, and it's converted just directly with the same dose of MST. Nobody realises that actually the, the equivalences are different. So somebody is either getting half or double the opioids that they had been getting the day before. Um, so it's just worth remembering that. Just when you mention toxicity, how do you recognise opioid toxicity <coughs> as opposed to the patient being more agitated or the patient becoming increasingly confused because of brain mass? And sometimes it's difficult. I mean, obviously, they're getting... Really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, they're getting sleepier, but there could be many reasons for that. And sometimes it, it, sometimes it isn't clear until you try to do something. Um, usually we'll look out for somebody hallucinating. If they're not communicating, they might be reaching out as if they're seeing things, or they might be talking to somebody who's not in the room. That would be a very common thing, or they're jumping, jerking. And do they get paranoid? with toxicity or is that not as big an issue? Is it more the hallucinations of the jerk? It's more commonly the hallucinations, but I mean, it can present in different ways. Help me out here. <laughs> I had a patient last week uh, who has been confused for four weeks and nobody knows why. All the bloods are fine, the CT brain is fine. Um, the, the, the disease is stable. We know that they've been on steroids for some time, not acutely on them, but it really, you, and they're on opioids as well. So it was a bit of a trial and error. So one day the opioids were reduced, no improvement. One day the steroids were reduced. You know, we then talk about, do we do an MRI brain? Because we've seen nothing in CT brain. There's something going on here that isn't adding up. We still don't know the answer to that. And we, we've been doing a wee bit of trial and error to see what works. So we've basically worked on the basis of, we've reduced the opioids, things haven't changed. They don't look toxic, they're not jerking. They don't appear to be hallucinating. So we're not gonna go any further with that reduction. It could be the steroids, they're not helping anyway. So we're gonna bring those down in the assumption that maybe that is the case. But underlying this, there could be something going on in the brain that we're not seeing. And I ordered an MRI brain, and then we talked to the oncology team and said, look, to be honest, we're actually not going to do anything about it, so there's no point in doing the MRI brain. So we aren't really any the wiser, but we're just trying to look at whatever might be reversible and do what we can. But sometimes it's just not clear cut. So how, how do you uh, manage opioid toxicity at 11 o'clock at night? This history is very suggestive of it. The carers are already giving them their evening dose. Uh, and it says, you're jerking all night, nobody's going to get any sleep. 
<laughs> Probably with difficulty in the community. Um, Haloperidol is really useful. <laughs> can sometimes decrease the symptoms of toxicity if they're distressed. If they were in a hospital, we, if they've had the evening dose, there's nothing you can do about it. If they're in a hospital, we put up a bag of fluids, we might give them a start dose of haloperidol. You might not have the same ability to give the fluids in the community. You could give some haloperidol for symptoms. Ultimately, you want to reduce the dose. Um, and also, you want to know whether, is there something here that we need to do something about? I mean, is this, is this something that could be acute renal failure or an infection or something that needs intervention? So that person, if, we, if you can't confidently say that there's nothing that you need to intervene, you might just need to send them to hospital. But if it's very end of life and you really do want to keep them home and manage end of life, it, it's really about managing the symptoms of that with a plan to reduce the opioids the next day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the diazepam and the diazepam for drug contractions will help mm -hmm. as well as the water medicine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you, uh -huh. if you then switch the oxycontin to diazepam, would that have a change on the fixes? Yeah, the I mean, say, or MST? It, it, it could do. I mean, if they've had their last dose, you're not going to do anything to improve it from that point of view overnight. If they're on a syringe driver and that has happened, I would probably just stop the syringe driver for a few hours and if you're worried about pain recurring you could stop it for a few hours and then either get it reloaded with a lower dose of the same drug or switch it over to an alternative opioid but just pull the dose down um, just be cautious with the dose and it will never go wrong with pulling the dose down as long as there's breakthroughs available and then it can be titrated up as, as needed but it's difficult if somebody's had a long acting drug that's going to last for 12 hours and if we think the renal function's going off it's probably going to last for longer than 12 hours so what do you do if you're saying it's accessible with hallucinations but they're still in pain, but their pain is not controlled? That's, that's when we would think about converting opioids. So if they're still in pain, but they're toxic, we obviously don't want to reduce down the opioid because they're going to get more sore. So that would be the situation where we'd convert the, opi the, the opioid. So we will say they're on a, a syringe driver with diamorphine and that happens. We will then look at the, you know, go through the, the conversions and look at the equivalent dose of oxynorm in a syringe driver. If they're very toxic, we'll probably pull the dose down a wee bit. Um, because we're changing drug and then um, but if they're you know if they're extremely sore we may just do it directly over but that's the exact situation for an opioid switch yeah. you've probably covered most of the examples the first one i thought of was just really simple you'd know it in your head but it was more just to navigate you around here i don't think we need to go through that um, and then the, that, the example you've just asked was the, exactly that last one. They're on diamorphine in the syringe driver. They're toxic. They're still sore. Um, so exactly that, we'll, we'll switch them over to the appropriate dose of oxynorm. The next one's about nausea. We've already talked about that. Um, and shortness of breath we've talked about. That's great. You've done all the work for me. Um, and then we, we haven't mentioned chest secretions. It's very common at the end of life to get really noisy chest secretions. Um, so again, back to the symptom guidelines. There's a page, sort of three or four pages in management of noisy chest secretions. There's two options, really. Glycopronium or hyacine. What would you be more familiar with? Hyacine, yeah. These guidelines say glyco, but we would be more familiar with hyacine as well. I think the reason for it is the occasional person might get more agitated with hyacine or they maybe get very drowsy. Usually when we're at this stage of life, the patient's drowsy anyway, and, on, and often the sedating um, effect of hyacine is really helpful for their agitation anyway. So usually it's the most appropriate one. If for whatever reason we are trying to avoid excess sedation, we might try glycopronium. Um, and there's good guidance there about doses. Normally, if somebody's chesty at the end of life, there's no point in putting in any less really than 1.2 milligrams of hyacine, which is the equivalent of three breakthrough doses over 24 hour periods. So we'll normally prescribe that and make sure the breakthroughs are available and then we'll titrate up the dose um, depending on how, how much they need or how chest they are the next day. And when we get to the maximum, which is 2.4 milligrams, we then use the glycopronium as breakthrough. Um, and then the next scenario is patient midazolam 40 in the syringe driver. They're very agitated. They've had three stats of five milligrams of midazolam. They've had no effect. So there's section in here about management of agitation just at the end of that section and it just talks about titrating up midazolam doses but if, if no, midazolam is no longer being effective then levomopromazine can be really useful for agitation as well but we'll keep the midazolam in the syringe driver as it is and add in the levomopromazine leave them with promising as well and we'll usually add in 12.5 milligrams and titrate that up and it may need even higher than that it depends on their level of agitation 
And then just the last, the last one there, I just wanted to highlight the use of alfentanyl. I don't know how familiar you are with using alfentanyl on a syringe driver. Probably not very much. Um, because of the metabolism of it, it's the safest opioid to use in renal failure. So if somebody has a very low EGFR and they're toxic, and, and that maybe relates back to your question as well, if that's the reason for their toxicity, if it's because their renal function is deteriorating, and we know it's not a reversible thing, so we're not, we're not sending them to hospital for fluids or sending them for nephrostomy tubes or things like that. Um, we, the, the most appropriate thing to do would be to look at the opioid they're on and switch it to alfentanyl in a syringe driver and that will, will allow them to have less opioid side effects. So alfentanyl is 10 times as strong as diamorphine. So you'll see at the bottom of the pain, sort of the second page of pain at the bottom of the first box, oral morphine, what, what, how we would normally do it is, is the equip, move from oral morphine to subcut diamorphine and then change, divide that by 10. So. Um, 10, 10 milligrams of diamorphine, the equivalent of one milligram of alfentanyl. So we're talking really small doses here and, and small increments, but that's the, the best opioid in renal failure. How, how easy is it to get? Is it a difficult drug for you to get? When, like, ketamine is incredibly difficult to get, but you seem to be able to get it in the hospice. But it's, quite, it, it's really very difficult for us to get ketamine in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Alfentanyl, I suspect, would probably be similar. It wouldn't have come with the ketamine, I don't think. He's using it for 24 hours. I'm sorry? He's using it for 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. Now, in saying that, actually, I did see somebody recently, and it was a similar situation, and it was a Friday afternoon, typically. Um, and and the patient didn't live near the pharmacy and we did do a lot of phoning around and we couldn't get it actually. So in that case we needed to go with really small doses of, I think it was diamorphine or oxynorm. Oxynorm is a better choice in renal failure than diamorphine, so if you're stuck, just small doses. I think if it hadn't been a Friday afternoon we probably could have got it the next day, but we were just unfortunate with the timing. Um, and that patient was fine and what we chose. But So just briefly, patient is on opioids but lots of neuropathic agents as well. They're now unable to swallow, you're putting them in a syringe driver and it was really just to highlight, obviously, they're not going to be able to take their neuropathic agent. So in that situation, you're converting over to the equivalent dose in a syringe driver, but you may well need to increase the dose a wee bit because they're going to probably miss some of their neuropathic agents. And then we also we talked about ketamine with that um, last case. But if the patient is on oral ketamine um, and they're now unresponsive, not able to swallow, if they really have a severe neuropathic pain and they've been very dependent on the ketamine, you can convert it over to a syringe driver to the exact same dose. Sometimes people don't need it. Sometimes the opioid at that time is enough but you just need to judge it on, on your patient. For example the patient I discussed at the, at the start, her you know she needed every drug she had and we had to convert it over to the syringe driver. I think she would have really missed it otherwise. And syringe drivers, I think you've got an example of a syringe driver chart, you probably see them all the time. So we use them if the patient can't swallow, if they're vomiting, if they're really weak and they can't take the medications. Sometimes if their symptoms are really difficult to control like the man you were talking about there um, that went to hospice. You know, in theory, the drugs should work the same orally as they do subcut, but sometimes if the patient is not controlled, we put them in a syringe driver and sometimes it works better. Um, so just important for these patients at the end of life, these are the kind of drugs that they should have prescribed to be available at home. So these, you want to have those drugs in the house and it, on a prescription chart so that the Marie Curie nurse is there, or the, whatever nurse is there in the middle of the night is able to give them and not phone in you to, to come and give them yourself. Um, and then this is the list of what's available in your out of hours box. I'm sure you're all familiar with that anyway, but they, they should be there and hopefully you won't be going lots of places to try and find those more common ones that we use. So I want to finish off with just telling you about a management plan that we have devised within the hospital because we um, recognise that a really difficult situation is those patients who we are seeing in hospital and we know they're very near the end of life, but that usually days, maybe a wee bit longer than that, and they really want to be at home. And that maybe wouldn't be our choice for them because they're complicated, but we need to fulfill, help them fulfill their wishes. So we're sending them home knowing that there's going to be problems arising. Um, so we devise, we recognise that sometimes these things aren't maybe being communicated as well as they could be, and you're then landing with this patient um, and you're not really clear of what's going on, what the plans are, and that makes things really difficult. So we use it when patients are going home from hospital or hospice for end of life care, and it's very end of life care, so days to weeks. Um, and 
it's a prompt to make sure we have these discussions with the families, but also that we're recording those discussions and making sure that you know the discussions that we've had. Um, and we are anticipating what problems we expect are going to happen, and we're making a plan and making sure the drugs are available so when that expected deterioration happens, there's, there's facility to deal with that. Obviously, we can't predict the unexpected, but we really just want to make sure that if it's something we expect to happen, that you have the confidence to know that it's expected, there's facility to deal with it, and we deal with it the best we can at home, if possible. And we all know that sometimes, we had a conversation there at break time, that sometimes we know what we're doing, but for whatever reason, whether it's social or practical or whatever, the patient can't stay at home despite having everything planned, and, we, and that's unavoidable. But we try our best to have things, have things available. So this is the form. There's a, I think you had a copy of it in your packs. And I sat down on the floor, beside each row, an example of a completed one, because I just wanted you to see how it really works in, in real life. Um, so it, you've probably all got different ones here, but I just picked a few that we'd filled in over the past number of months. So for example, um, one of them is a patient who has brain mets that we're expecting they're gonna go home and they're probably gonna have a seizure. So I am writing down anticipated event as a seizure, and I'm writing down what you're gonna do about it. So. I, it, a stat of buccal midazolam for the family to give and that's been sent home with the patient um, and if that doesn't work um, subcut midazolam which is also sent home and then instructions to increase the syringe driver if the patient can't swallow their oral and epileptics we're leaving instructions about stopping them and increasing midazolam in the syringe driver if the patient give, is sore we're given instructions about what to do about the pain and how to increase and what, and what to increase for that so it's really just trying to predict what we think is going to happen and how best to manage that um, and then another example there is somebody we expect might have pulmonary edema and shortness of breath, give them a stat of opioids, they might have a terminal bleed, they don't come back to hospital for that, they get midazolam for that, or they may have a seizure of midazolam. So I think you've all got some different examples there, but really I don't want to bore you by going through, de going through the details of them, but it's really just for us to try and work, to communicate with you what we think might happen and where we think the patient should be cared for and make sure the drugs are available to do that. Uh, for, for those symptoms to be managed in the place where the, the patient wants them, wants them to be. Um, so I hope, I, I don't know if any of you have received any of those or, or found them helpful. They're not that frequent, but it's those sort of kind of end of life crisis people that we, we try to, to, to use them. Um, so that's my bit over. Um, you've maybe asked all your questions, but I'll sit down and you can ask more if you want and you two can answer this time.